to simplify the issue for you so you can actually understand it. We realize that the other debates have been a little messy, so I hope that the way we present this can make it understandable. So let's take a look. What are the questions that need to be answered in this debate? First of all, what is the function of currency? And second of all, why, does, why can this function only work if countries have independent currencies, which is not, which is very different to the single currency? And the last question that we'll answer is which currency, which form of currency is best suited to handle um, an economic crisis, which will directly engage with the arguments coming from opening government. What a closing opposition brings in this debate is firstly that the function of currency serves as a comparative advantage and as a tool to drive economic growth for countries. We're talking specifically towards developing countries. But furthermore, it's very important that these countries have flexibility in determining their economic planning if they want to progress. No, it's very different for public opposition, even though we use the same terms as comparative advantage. I'll explain to you why. Because opening opposition only goes towards the extent that they have they have subjective needs. For example, some countries want to do austerity, some countries want to do protectionism. This and they only go towards the extent that uh, currency is an indicator for growth. We think they only play on a very speculative level. What opposing opposition is going to bring to you is we're going to show you practically that currency is not only an indicator for growth, but currency actually supports growth, but furthermore, why better development will be strengthened under our proposal that will create tangible harms. But the thing that we need to establish is that first of all, we do not exist in a paradigm where in single currency eliminates all the harms of economic problems that today. A government side of the house is living in a very unrealistic condition. So we need to agree that by having a single currency, it will not eliminate economic disparity, nor will it solve the different bargaining positions of those countries. Those ideas will be directly intertwined with my case. But before I move on, I have one sort of rebuttal towards Risky's case. We also agree on trade liberalization, so there's that. But the, but that's the, the rebuttal that needs to be addressed. He says that currency is hard to convert. Well, we think this is a matter of technicality. It's not that hard to convert because currency is based on your export and import. We've been doing it for a very long time. That's not problematic. But second of all, he says that currency acts as a form of trade barrier. We don't agree because the reason why states want to invest in another state is not simply because of the currency, but because of other matters, for example, stable political condition or is there or in the existence of a good market share. If they see there are people who want to buy their items, regardless the currency is high or low, they will sell that anyway because market segmentation exists. In my argument, I'll explain to you why it's even better if the currency is low, this will help the development of certain countries. So let's move on to the case coming from, um, from closing opposition. First of all, we think that the function of currency is not only a tool to value your goods or determine your price in terms of export or import. It also serves as a tool of comparative advantage that drives competition which will lead to growth. What do we mean by that? By comparative advantage, we know that countries such as EU or the US have industrialized a long time ago. We're not able to compete in their very sophisticated technological industries where they're moving on to biotechnology or they're moving on to making robots. Indonesia cannot compete with that. Therefore, the market segmentation and the comparative advantage of these countries are is that they sell very high costly goods to other developing countries. In this situation, the only opportunity for success that other developing countries have is if they play on two scenarios in which they have a better quality item or if they have an item that is of lower price. We think it's very hard for developing countries to battle on making robots because we don't have the capacity. But even when we're talking about the prices, you know, we're talking about organic fruits, for example, it still might be hard for developing countries to catch up with the quality of imported fruits and apples from the US, for example. That's why our comparative advantage lies in our ability to cater to the lower market segmentation. In order for this to happen, you need to have a low currency. You need to be able to show that your consumers have the ability to purchase your goods. We're talking about domestic consumers. This condition cannot exist if you have a single currency because then there is no comparative advantage. Everybody is not battling on price. Everybody is battling on quality. In that scenario, you are only supporting the goods coming from EU and the US because if everything is at the same price, then you will only pick based on quality. So we would probably prefer to use our money wisely and buy a more better quality good. Now, why is this better under our proposal when you still have the idea of, uh, so why is it better when you have the idea of flexible currency? Now, we think this is better for growth because it is a measure that investors are looking, uh, that investors want to be attracted to your country. We think that investors have different segmentations. Not all investors want to invest in very high quality goods. It's very important for us to be able to attract investors not only with our human resources or um, or our, you know, our natural 
natural resources, but also with our competitive price point. Because low prices mean that we pay low wages. Low wages means that these investors can create more aggregate benefits as opposed to when you have a single currency that is standardized. There is no comparative advantage to investors. They are not going to look at price as a consideration factor anymore. Therefore, they will look towards people um, based on human resources, and we will lose out to the Americans who may have better degrees than us. So that's why single currency is very bad, because you eliminate the idea of comparative advantage. Before I move on, though. You said the comparative advantage will always be there when we're talking about wage standard. Wage standard in Hungary is different with the wage standard in Germany, even when they are in the one currency. Okay, so isn't that worse under your proposal then? Because then people in developing countries don't have an opportunity to compete. They will ultimately lose out to the people in developing countries. Now let's move on to further. Why this hampers development? Why do countries want to help other countries develop? It's not because they're very altruistic in nature, but it's because they see that there is, first of all, development is feasible. By that I mean development, the cost of products and items used to develop is much cheaper. For example, it's cheaper to build roads in Indonesia because maybe we can get cheaper tar from China as opposed to it is to the US. But furthermore, countries want to help us develop because they see that there is a comparative advantage in the future in helping us develop. Japan helped us build roads because they wanted to sell Toyota cars in the future. That's why Japan is not helping us make an MRT. We think what happens when you still are able to have the comparatively low price point, so we're still able to attract countries in order to help us grow. So one of my first argument, I've explained to you that this limits growth. And when you have a single currency, it eradicates comparative advantage and makes it much harder for countries to want to invest in their development. But lastly, on the issue of crisis management, we think crisis management should always have multiple platforms and multiple layers. You cannot only rely on the domestic security of one country to do austerity measures. What we need in the ideal scenario is for one institution, for instance, IMF or WTO, to have a security and a safety net in instances where single countries fail. We think it's much better when you have the idea of a strong currency, because then the strong currency, which is much better than other currencies, can be used to be liquidated in the form of market securities, and um, their value will be much